Greetings from Camino Lutheran Church on this fourth Sunday in the season of Epiphany. The grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God, and the communion of the Holy Spirit be with you all. Amen. We continue our worship together with confession and forgiveness. Trusting in God's mercy, let us confess our sin together. Holy One, source of our renewal, we confess that we are wrapped up in sin and cannot free ourselves. We have not practiced your righteousness. Our hearts have turned away from you. For the sake of the world you so love, forgive us, that we may be reconciled to one another for the glory of your holy name. Amen. Thus says our God, the former things have come to pass, and new things I now declare. God's mercy makes us new. We are forgiven in the name of Jesus Christ, our Savior. Amen. from Micah chapter 6 beginning with the first verse hear what the Lord says rise plead your case before the mountains and let the hills hear your voice hear you mountains the controversy of the Lord and you enduring foundations of the earth for the Lord has a controversy with his people and he will contend with Israel 
O my people, what have I done to you? In what have I wearied you? Answer me, for I have brought you up from the land of Egypt and redeemed you from the house of slavery. And I sent before you Moses, Aaron, and Miriam. O my people, remember now what, the, what King Balak of Moab devised, what Balaam, son of Beor, answered him, and what happened from Shittim to Gilgal, that you may know the saving acts of the Lord. With what shall I come before the Lord and bow myself before God on high? Shall, <clears throat> shall I come before him with burnt offerings, with calves a year old? Will the Lord be pleased with thousands of rams, with ten thousands of rivers of oil? Shall I give my firstborn for my transgression? the fruit of my body for the sin of my soul. He has told you, O mortal, what is good, and what does the Lord require of you, but to do justice and to love kindness and to walk humbly with your God. Word of hope, word of life. Thanks be to God. about the cross is foolishness to those who are perishing, but to us who are being saved it is the power of God. For it is written, I will destroy the wisdom of the wise, and the discernment of the discerning I will thwart. Where is the one who is wise? Where is the scribe? Where is the debater of this age? Has not God made foolish the wisdom of the world? For since in the wisdom of God the world did not know God through wisdom. God decided through the foolishness of our proclamation to save those who believe. For Jews demand signs and Greeks desire wisdom. But we proclaim Christ crucified, a stumbling block to Jews and foolishness to Gentiles. But to those who are called, both Jews and Greeks, Christ the power of God and the wisdom of God. For God's foolishness is wiser than human wisdom, and God's weakness is stronger than human strength. Consider your own call, brothers and sisters. Not many of you were wise by human standards. Not many were powerful. Not many were of noble birth. But God chose what is foolish in the world to shame the wise. God 
chose what is weak in the world to shame the strong. God chose what is low and despised in the world, things that are not, to reduce to nothing things that are, so that no one might boast in the presence of God. He is the source of your life in Christ Jesus, who became for us wisdom from God and righteousness and sanctification and redemption, in order that, as it is written, let the one who boasts, boast in the Lord. Word of hope, word of life. Thanks be to God. The Holy Gospel on this fourth Sunday in the season of Epiphany is the Sermon on the Mount, taken from Matthew chapter 5, verses 1 through 12. When Jesus saw the crowds, he went up the mountain, and after he had sat down, his disciples came to him. Then he began to speak and taught them, saying, Blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Blessed are those who mourn, for they will be comforted. Blessed are the meek, for they will inherit the earth. Blessed are those who hunger and thirst for righteousness, for they will be filled. Blessed are the merciful, for they will receive mercy. Blessed are the pure in heart, for they will see God. Blessed are the peacemakers, for they will be called children of God. Blessed are those who are persecuted for righteousness' sake, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Blessed are you when people revile you and persecute you and utter all kinds of evil against you on my account. Rejoice and be glad, for your reward is great in heaven. For in the same way, they persecuted the prophets who were before you. Word of hope, word of life, thanks be to God. Let us pray. Gracious God, bless the words of my mouth, the meditations of my heart, that they are pleasing to you and faithful to your gospel. These things I pray in your Son, Jesus' name. Amen. Well, last week's message had a harsh edge to it. At least it felt like that for me as the one delivering the message. It's like that any time we're talking about the prophets and we go back to their words to the people of that time and day where they call them to take an honest look at the reality of their lives particularly when it's come to a place where they become so comfortable and even beyond that comfort, moving towards more and more and just not even realizing it. And they're so strong in their words because they seek to bring healing not only to the people they're calling back, but particularly because they're thoughtful and thinking about the people that are mentioned in our gospel reading, the Sermon on the Mount on this day. So we'll take a look at the Sermon on the Mount, and I'm only going to focus on the first four, per se, and then touch just gently on one of the last four, summarizing the last four as a whole. So as we take a look at the Beatitudes, I want to start with just looking at the first four. Um, what, what do these terms even mean? Blessed are the poor in spirit. Who are they? These are the ones who are dispossessed and abandoned ones. Think about the people of Israel, their time um, in, as, as slaves in Egypt, how they must have felt abandoned year after year, month after month, of feeling they were trapped in this, that God had left and gone away. That's the feeling of the people who are poor in spirit. These are the folks that have lost hope. These aren't pious people who trust God because there was no reason who trust God because there's no reason for hope in the world. No, these are people who have no reason to hope in this world, period. That's the poor in spirit. Perhaps you felt you've been in that space or you've heard of others who have been or someone you know, you would say, yes, they have been there. The next one is blessed are those who mourn. These are the miserable, the unhappy, these are those who cannot find any cause for joy. I think about a couple people in my own life recently whose loss is so painful that though they try to get on with life at this, at this point, it just keeps finding and raising its ugly head, the pain and hurt that comes from a deep, deep loss. Maybe it's the loss of a loved one, the loss of a job, a vocation, the loss of a relationship, a friendship, 
um, the loss of a sense of identity, a loss of physical use of, of our bodies that we once had that just takes them to a place that they just can't seem to find a sense of joy anywhere. Those are people who mourn. Those who lament even God's own community and what they're seeing happening or not happening within that community. Those who mourn are those not seeing God's kingdom in, in, in the world or actions of the church or God's people. Those are the ones who are mourning. And what of the meek? How about you when you think about the meek? You probably think of uh, someone who's calm and quiet, kind of shy and reserved. In fact, oftentimes we think of a person who's just sweet and polite, but, but no, that's not what's being talked about here. When we see the meek, it's the humiliated, the walked on, the doormats, the powerless. They have not been given their share of the earth. They have been denied access to the world's resources and have not had the opportunity to enjoy the creation that God intended for the people of God. Think of Jesus' own time and the people he's speaking to. Yes, indeed, there's, there's ability to go and worship, but what happens when they go to worship? They come to worship and the people try to rip them off who are selling the goods that they need to use for sacrifice. Thus Jesus turning over the tables in the temple. These are the ones that the Romans come out to, to the peasants, to where the money collectors tech, and tax collectors take more than they're supposed to, pocketing their, lining their own pockets um, and being pushed to pay rates of tax that they just can't afford when they are already barely getting by to survive. Yes, that is the meek. And then the fourth one, those who hunger and thirst for righteousness. These are those that it depicts a longing, a desire, a sense of deprivation, knowing God's will is not being done on earth. They long for it to happen and they look and everywhere they see it seems to be non-existence. Those who hunger and thirst for righteousness that has been denied to them are, it's reflected even back in those first three, people who have no reason for hope people who have no cause for joy, and people who have no access to the resources of the world. Again, this isn't just a nice moral list to, to live up to, to that we have laid out before us, but what we see here is an absolute powerful, deep struggle that people are going through. And we often think of God's comfort and God's prosperity being upon us or being blessed as through signs of prosperity, peace, and comfort. In fact, we look at those things, and even as, I, as Jesus is proclaiming, uh, blessed are you who are poor in spirit, for yours is the kingdom of God. Blessed are you who mourn, for you will be, you, you know the second half, but we are a people when we are hurting that we want it now. We don't want to wait. We don't want to have to wait especially difficult for us in our culture in this day and time when we are in e a quick access and many of our things are taken care of right away and placed in our care. This is the same thing that um, Episcopal priest um, Dennis Anderson was wrestling with. He said, I'm kind of partial. I'm, I'm partial to the kind of prosperity that ensures that I don't have to cry. And I'm not alone, and he ties into the people of Israel. You see it throughout the Hebrew scriptures. The sense of blessing equals prosperity, blessing equals comfort. And indeed, we see that throughout the scriptures. But what of these people that Jesus is talking to? You see, Jesus is turning the world upside down. Even in his day, so many looked and saw that, well, prosperity means that God is with you. You are comforted. God is with you. But what about when you don't feel that? When you are the poor in spirit, when you are the one who mourns, when you are the one who hungers and thirsts for righteousness, when you, when you are those ones that I just made mentioned, where is God then? He goes on to write, This past summer I presided over my denomination's general assembly when we adopted the confession of, I hope I say this right, Belhar. The confession rose out of apartheid, the apartheid era in South Africa. People, if there's a people who know what it means to be persecuted, 
to mourn, to be hungry, to seek after righteousness. It is that group indeed. And he goes on, he says, it rose out of uh, apartheid era in South Africa, and among its most elegant assertions is that, is that, quote, God in a world full of injustice and enmity is in a special way the God of the destitute, the poor, and the wronged, end quote. That is the promise that Jesus is making in our gospel reading for today to all those people to look and know that they may be in there, but God in a world full of injustice, injustice and enmity is in a special way the God of the destitute, the poor and the wrong. He's lifting up to them. This text isn't per se to the wealthy, to the comfortable, but to those who are in that place of hurting. He goes on to say, God is the God of the destitute. God is the God of the poor. God is the God of the wronged. The portion of the confession, this portion of confession, as far as I can tell, is one of the best expositions of the Beatitudes in existence today. It says that God is not necessarily impressed with the impressive. God does not necessarily pr feel privileged to be among the privileged. The blessed ones are the ones who are unimpressive. The blessed ones are those who are often overlooked by the privileged. He says, I celebrate a God who is not daunted by our loneliness, our lowliness. As lost as we feel when we mourn, we are no farther from God than when things were more enjoyable. In fact, might God be even closer in those times? Might the blessing be that God is not put off with us when we are at our worst? Might the blessing be to have a God that doesn't rush our grief, but lets us weep? Aren't we blessed to have a God who doesn't tell us not to cry, but says instead, I am here. And this is where the second half of the Beatitudes comes in. The importance of being able, whether you are those who have been there and have come through, or you are those in a position to do so, that you offer your gifts to God. And we take a look at the fourth one in that second half. Blessed are those who are being persecuted for the sake of righteousness, for the sake of justice. This is about a people being committed to those that I just mentioned, despite the world's often strong push against such virtues, they are participating in what God is doing. Blessed are those who are persecuted. They are the ones in the midst of all of this, and oftentimes the very people that Jesus is speaking to who are working so hard and bearing their gifts in life to help people see that they are not left alone, that God is present with them in those times and spaces. Time, that's something that I think is difficult when we look at things like this because again, as I said, we want things quickly and yet God worked for the people in the lives of the people of Israel. God journeyed with the folks in Babylon and God journeys with us even today. I end with a quick story of a pastor who had talked to me and he was sharing that he had given a sermon and that sermon mostly came from it was about himself and the pain that he was experiencing in his own life and he laid that out and the honesty of that pain um, and how important it was for him just to have people present in his life he didn't need them spouting off platitudes he didn't need them um, saying little phrases and cliches that you get off the internet somewhere. He just needed them to be present. And that's what was transforming to him. And as he shared that, he finished and after the service went to fellowship hour and sat down and there happened to be three ladies. And all three of these women went through the exact same painful, painful experience as mothers when they were first mothers. Great loss in their life and they looked and they shared and they shared the story with him he'd never heard it before and had known him for a long time and yet in this time and space they knew he understood that he connected 
with them and their loss. Yes, they had experienced God in the past or they wouldn't have probably been sitting within that sanctuary to hear that message. But here all these years later, they were still comforted because God continues to show up for those who mourn, for the meek, for all of us who find ourselves in a place of pain and hurt. Jesus lays this out so the disciples can know God keeps God's promises. So the disciples can begin to learn that yes, this is a love of the God that we reflect to the world. So how about for you? Have you had those moments where you've mourned, when you've been the meek, and you can say, yeah, this is where I saw God show up. And if you're in that space now and are still waiting, I promise you, God is present in it right now. That's the cross. The cross is the reminder. God continues to be with us through no matter what. Amen. Jesus, we pray for the church, the world, and all in need. Cultivate humility in your church. In gatherings of every size, teach us to boast only in the cross. Shape your church to be people of kindness, generosity, and justice. Merciful God, receive our prayer. The foundations of the earth bear witness to your faithfulness. The mountains and hills echo with your holiness. When we mistreat your creation, show us the error of our ways. Inspire us with reverent awe to honor all you have made. Merciful God, receive our prayer. You make foolish the wisdom of the world. Raise up honorable leaders who seek justice, love mercy, and pursue peace. Frustrate plans that are corrupt wicked and self-seeking. Prosper the work of peacemakers. Merciful God, receive our prayer. Bless all whom the world rejects. Accompany those who are regarded as foolish, weak, low, and despised. Reveal your power and presence at work where it is least expected. Give your life, strength, and wisdom to all in need, especially Zaid, Irma, Tracy Hawk, 
Shannon Chapton, Christian Lopez, Clara Robles, Deanna Calm Hudson, Jerry, Greg, and Kim, Jeanette, Karen, Kelly, Greg Luce, and Ed. We pray for the multiple communities ravaged by gun violence. Bring them strength and comfort in the days ahead and encourage leaders to work together on understanding what might be done to curb future atrocities like this. We also remember those named in our bulletin on our prayer chain and those we name aloud are in the silence of our hearts at this time. Merciful God, receive our prayer. As with your people, Israel, remind this congregation of your saving acts. Remind us how your faithfulness brought us through difficulties and sustained us despite our weaknesses. Establish the cross as the center of our life together. Merciful God, receive our prayer. Praise to you for your blessed saints in every time and place, trusting you accompanied them in poverty, persecution, and in every trial. We trust you abide with your people always. Merciful God, receive our prayer. We bring to you our needs and hopes, O God, trusting your wisdom and power revealed in Christ crucified. Amen. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory, forever and ever. Amen. Let us pray. Liberating God, you break the bonds of injustice and let the oppressed go free. Receive these offerings and thanksgiving for all your works of merciful power and shape us as people of your justice and freedom. You we magnify and adore, through Jesus our Savior. Amen. for our announcements from the small sanctuary this week. Uh, some important ones coming up. Uh, first of all, Benevolence of the Month, Safe Harbor Clinic offers free health care to those um, 
who are in need of that here in the Stanwood Camino area. Just a wonderful gift of ministry that's provided. We've had folks within our own community here at CLC who have used, who have been able to go over and have, have used the, the services there and they just continue to be a real blessing. So if that's something you'd like to give a little extra to, you can go to our, our website and donate online. Just hit the donate button. Um, or you can, if you send in a check, just down in the, in the um, corner, write uh, BOM and Safe Harbor Clinic, and we'll make sure that gets there. OPOP, One Parish, One Prisoner. Uh, many of you are aware our friend Kelly is, is in prison currently. Uh, we'll be out sometime in August. And we are kind of doing a revamp with our OPOP team. And so one of the leaders from OPOP is going to be with us here on February 5th. February 5th at 1 o'clock after the new member class, which I'm going to get to in a minute, um, over here in the, the Pioneer Hall. If you would like to, you haven't been a part of the One Parish, One Prisoner program um, and would like to be, we're coming back to the start. We're going to journey through the module so you learn all the details of, of what it's about. But if you think that's something that you would like to be a part of, if you have any questions, you can ask me as well or Paul and Charlotte Schaup can fill you in as well on that. But if you'd like to come join us and hear about that, uh, see some of the beginning details, and, and if you'd want to be a part of that, it's, you don't have to commit at that time, but maybe have some questions uh, for Alvin from OPOP or any of us that have been currently um, are part of the team. Be happy to answer those questions. Again, 1 o'clock in the Pioneer Hall. And then the annual meeting uh, is Sunday the 29th of January, which is happening either right after you watch this, if you watch it right after you got it, or maybe it has happened already. That's right after our, our worship service, so about 11.15 or so in the, the large sanctuary. Thanks to everybody who, who was able to come be a part of that. New member class that I mentioned. Finally having our new member class, been waiting for a little while, and that is going to start February 5th, and we'll have the three Sundays. So it's during the normal adult ed hour. So it starts about 11.15ish or so after worship in the small sanctuary. Anybody is welcome to come to that. Even if you're already a member, just would like to kind of have a refresher on some of the things that we go over or talk about, you're welcome to come and, and be a part of that. Uh, it does not commit you to have to become a new member. Um, maybe you come and just want to learn more about CLC, and, and that's what this, this time together is for. We've reserved uh, three Sundays. We'll see who who we have and, and what some of the questions are and if that takes us the full three Sundays. Then after that, we're gonna be begin, beginning started with our uh, Lenten Adult Education Hour and we'll get more information on that as it comes closer. Last but not least, uh, maybe you're watching but sometimes you're here for in-person worship. Uh, one of the things you often see is flowers. <clears throat> and so if flowers are something that you'd like to donate for the worship time, you can do it in honor of somebody, a birthday, a loved one um, who you've lost, whatever it might be, an anniversary. There's a flower chart in the large sanctuary right to the left of the double doors where you head towards the office. So if you'd like to sign up for flowers, you can just go ahead and sign your name on there. Then we know someone's got that week covered. Those are all of our announcements, <coughs> which is good because I'm about to have a coffee fit. So God's peace and blessings. We'll see you next week.